thank you so much for being here. I'm absolutely thrilled that we've managed to drag along on a very snowy and nasty Chicago day four really exciting scholars of energy and extraction across a bunch of very different regions. The Russian and North American Arctic, which is very rarely put in conversation with the global south, and we have representatives working on both Brazil and Lebanon, as you'll hear more about in a second. A word about the format, we are keeping it fairly informal, chatty, roundtable-y. Um, so everybody's uh, put up a few images that they're going to use as hooks to give a few opening remarks. Then we'll have a bit of roundtable discussion amongst the panellists before opening to you good folks. Um, before that happens, I'm going to introduce the two of us. I'm Elizabeth Chatterjee, Assistant Professor of Environmental History. This is Alexander Arroyo, Senior Research Associate at the Urban Theory Lab. Um, and the genesis of this is that I work uh, a lot on uh, energy policy um, and India. And with colleagues uh, Ryan Jobson and Victoria Saramago, we have a project called Fossil Capitalism in the Global South sponsored by the Neubauer Collegium, and got talking to Alexander about his really interesting work on the Arctic and thought it would be amazing to put something together. He's going to tell you in a second a little bit about what we had in mind in bringing together the Global South and what we're calling Native Norths in this way. But before that, just a few words of thanks. First of all, thank you to the Committee on Environment, Geography and Urbanization, SIGU, the brand new interdisciplinary formation, especially to Neil Brenner and Michael Fish for sponsoring this, as well to the Urban Theory Lab for their generous sponsorship and the, that new Bauer project, Fossil Capitalism in the Global South. Thank you enormously to Carlo Diaz and Danielle Smith for putting together all the uh, beautiful publicity works and finding this room at the last minute when we realized our venue could only seat about 14 people. Uh, huge thanks as well to uh, the Environmental Studies Workshop, another sponsor of this, and to Sachet Pandey in particular, Carmine Morrow, the other graduate student coordinator, and a special thanks to you guys, who I'm going to introduce in a second. But first, for the brain work here, I'm going to pass it over to Alexander. Thanks, Liz. So if you looked at the poster, you might have seen some sort of jumble of pink and blue. Uh, underneath the the text, and I just wanted to sort of offer this as a backdrop for our reflections today. So what what this actually is is uh, two sites that are important for uh, various geographies that we're going to be talking about today, um, overlaid with graticules from latitudinal and longitudinal lines from different projected coordinate systems, and both of those coordinate systems are centered on these disparate sites. And part of the idea here was to invoke this sort of entanglement across centering sites in the global south and these native norths that allow for us to think across those spaces but not over determine their relations right not seek some kind of simplistic set of connections that we can track in a merely linear way so this kind of enmeshment is something that we wanted to foreground as one of the the sort of themes or provocations for today so let me offer a, a few more formal thoughts on on how we might approach this so the, the historical and speculative geographies of extractivism, particularly with respect to, to fossil capital uh, and empire, really cut across these facile distinctions between the de develop, developmental figures of the, the global south uh, and global north. And unlikely connections begin to emerge between, for instance, the exhaustion of Norwegian oil fields in the North Sea, and the exporting of deep water extractive expertise to the coastal waters of Nigeria or Suriname or Azerbaijan. And more uncanny perhaps are these sort of telemorphic effects of historic carbon emissions by the ruling classes of the global north on the polar cryosphere, which turn, for instance, Greenland's ice sheets into Bangladesh's floods. So this roundtable tries to bring together scholars working across, as Liz mentioned, Russian and North American Arctics, Brazil and Lebanon, and Palestine for a conversation across regions that are rarely placed in the same frame. And in doing so, we want to open up a set of sort of exploratory questions. 
We don't know where this is going to go. That's what's great about it. So we want to sort of keep this open, keep it loose, but provide a little bit of a structure. So here are a couple of provocations. How might we think the histories of colonial and capitalist resource frontiers and ecological transformations beyond these global binaries of North and South? That's a sort of obvious one. Now, while scholars across disciplines continue to provoke alternative imaginings of the global South and South-South relational geographies, the global North often appears to retain this kind of stubborn conceptual coherence, even or perhaps especially as the object of stringent critique, particularly of something called global capitalism. But what other histories, spaces, and modes of relation between Souths and Norths might emerge if we instead foreground, for instance, a primary and persistent multiplicity of native Norths? How might, in turn, might we understand the global North as both an imperial geographic formation that's really designed around colonial extractivism and as a kind of aspirational metageography that tries to sort of extract itself or sublimate itself out of the messy cartographies of the kind of enmeshments and entanglements between many Norths and Souths. And particularly in the context of thinking about how this attempts to sort of steady the shaky grounds, increasingly shaky grounds, I should say, of settler colonialism, not only settler colonialism, but one of its formations, uh, fossil capitalism, and especially as these grounds are troubled by indigenous and post-colonial sovereignties. So what other histories and possibilities of relation might we attend in this encounter of native Norths and global Souths? What frictions, desires, intimacies, resistances generated by energy extractivism across very different settings might emerge? What political solidarities are transformed, translocalized, and really remapped or even unmapped through the forces of fossil capitalism? And finally, to what alternative futures might we become attuned if decarbonization and decolonization are part of the same geographic imaginary? So I'll stop there. Hopefully that's not sort of too heavy handed, but I think the, the speakers will give you their own take on various ways of cutting across some of these questions. And I'll turn it over to Liz to introduce the speakers in turn. Yes, and as, as usual, first is Bathsheba DeMuth. Uh, Dean's Associate Professor of History and Environment and Society at Brown University, where she specializes in the lands and seas of the Russian and North American Arctic. Her multiple prize winning first book, Floating Coasts, an environmental history of the Bering Strait, which I know is a, a fan favorite for many of you here, was named best book of 2019 by Nature, NPR, Kirkus Reviews and Library Journal, amongst others. Her writing appears in venues from the American Historical Review to the New Yorker and the Best American series. A current Carnegie Fellow, she is currently researching a book on the Yukon, Yukon River watershed from colonialism to climate change. And we're very glad she's made time out from her travels um, for that research today. Up second, Matthew P. Johnson is an energy and environmental historian at Harvard University Center for the Environment, whose research America area is modern Latin America with an emphasis on Brazil and increasingly the Caribbean. Matthew is especially interested in projects that relate to energy, dam building and socio-environmental justice as separate and overlapping issues. He wrote his PhD dissertation at Georgetown about social environmental impacts of Brazil's big hydropower dams, and is currently working on his second big research project, an environmental history of the Caribbean's oil refineries. Up third is Owen Lawson, Shirk postdoctoral fellow in the University of Toronto Department of History. There he is completing his first book, Power Failures, Development, Sovereignty and Environmental Justice in Lebanon. Owen is also co-editor of the Arab Studies Journal and co-editor of the Jadalia Environment page and received his PhD in history from Columbia in 2021. Jen Rose Smith is assistant professor of geography and American Indian studies of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, she is an EAC geographer um, interested in the intersections of coloniality, race, and indigeneity, as read through aesthetic and literary contributions, archival evidence, and experiential embodied knowledge. She's currently completing a book manuscript, Icy Matters, Race, Indigeneity, and Coloniality in Ice Geographies, which takes seriously the uh, following the flows of ice as a material in itself. 
She holds a PhD from UC Berkeley in Comparative Ethnic Studies and is part of the editorial collective for the journal ACME, an international journal for critical geographies. So over to you guys. Um, I think if, as long as you make sure you have a, a mic in hand and bark, slide when you need to transfer between images. on okay that yes it's like nobody can hear me on zoom i don't think um well first of all thank you to to liz and alexander for uh convening us here today it's a real joy to be here um i feel personally responsible for the weather you're having because whenever i come to chicago i basically guarantee there's some sort of gale um i was telling one of my friends who lives here that i usually come and just get sand blasted by wind off the lake so it's my fault um I'm particularly happy to be here today because um, I feel like as somebody who works very much in kind of northern geographies, I spend a lot of time when I hear colleagues who work on parts of the global south kind of talk about the dynamics there that I'm often in the back wanting to be like, but what what about what about where where I've been? <laughs> um, and this panel feels like a chance to kind of think through where it is that I have been seeing those commonalities and sort of wanting to draw some of those enmeshments that Alexander was just alluding to. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and so the, the kind of three images I'm gonna talk about today are ones that I chose because um, they, they indicate places where when I hear my colleagues who are specialists in Lebanon or in Brazil or in the Caribbean or other parts of the world where I have never been and have very little historical depth or familiarity, I feel like I'm hearing echoes or um, overlaps or kind of productive tensions with dynamics that I have seen um, in parts of the global north. And just to be clear, I think there are other analogies outside of Alaska and Siberia, which are primarily where I'm talking about today. I just don't happen to know very much about them. So that's where I'm emphasizing rather than um, thinking about, say, Louisiana's Cancer Alley, right, which is another place where I think if we're talking about extraction, some of these same dynamics may be at play. So my the three images I chose are really about a kind of ideological enmeshment um, that I see at play in Alaska, Northern Canada, and Northern Russia. Um, and I'm curious, really, with my other panelists as to how, if they see these ideas as actually enmeshed with the dynamics on the ground um, in the places where they work. And what I'm going to be talking about today are all the kind of the judgments and ideas of temperate zone places of political power. Um, they came to borrow a phrase uh, from Jen from kind of a, a place of temperate normativity, right? They're, they're building on ideas that emerge out of agricultural industrial expectations that have a particular climate around them and projecting them up north. Um, and they're projecting them as part of both capitalist and socialist colonial projects in the 20th, 19th and 20th century. So this first image, um, which is a stamp from the Soviet Union, um, this one's from 1930 something, I think. Um, it's kind of the anchors my first point, which in some ways is almost so basic, it doesn't feel like it needs to be said. But on the other hand, I, I think it kind of underpins most of the other dynamics I'm talking about. And that is the idea that is quite prevalent, both in the, the sort of ideological projections I see in the United States and in the Soviet Union of looking at the North as empty, right? So here we have our polar bears. This is in the 1930s. So these are healthy polar bears. We don't have the skinny ones of the projections of the, the 2020s. Um, you have some explorers tents um, and you have a Soviet flag that's been planted on a nice iceberg. Um, but this is not an image about anybody actually living here, right? It's not an image that is even kind of capable of thinking about forms of sovereignty and knowledge that predated the arrival of airplanes um, and the kind of other technological prowess that's being projected. This is one of dozens and dozens of stamps in the Soviet Union that that um, kind of represent the Arctic in various ways. They generally speaking have walruses and polar bears. They generally speaking don't have human beings unless they are known Soviet explorers. Um, 
of a very particular type kind of are literally planting flags, right? This is one of these texts where there is no subtext, right? They pretty much scream uh, the quiet part out loud. Um, and I think that what these images are, are kind of a purified form of the terra nullis idea that is so fundamental to legal formulations and, and the kind of political process of colonization across many parts of the world, but certainly very operative um, in the North. And I'm curious if there is resonance with ideas of the kind of deepest Africa or uh, ways in which parts of tropical climates in the Amazon are represented as being empty, or if not empty, only peopled by a kind of human life that's not able to directly assert sovereignty or kind of fundamental important knowledge about the place. Um, and I honestly don't know. I'm kind of curious, but the um, the kind of projection of emptiness is so powerful and continuous in the case of the Arctic. And of course, it's not true. Um, that almost goes without saying. It's not true in ways that are often recognized by colonial practitioners themselves. Um, but yet at the same time, there's kind of this constant cultural production of emptiness through various forms. Um, and therefore, the land is opened up for certain kinds of seizure by the state, by individuals, um, and is usually the site of a usually kind of white male self-perfection through the act of seizure, right? The flag planting is a very important identity building project. So that's that's the first case, right? Basically, the North is empty would be the shorthand. I just used lots of words to say that. The second image, is actually one of my favorite images to show. Um, this is a piece of carved walrus tusk. Um, it's carved by um, an artist um, from a kind of particular um, walrus carving studio in a village called Ulen on the Russian side of the Bering Strait um, from a master carver named Vukvod. Um, and it depicts Lenin hanging around on a stuffed seal skin chatting with a bunch of Chukchi men, you know, as Lenin was wont to do, right? Um, well, well known activity of your Bolshevik leaders. Um, what interests me about this picture is that it's um, kind of a follow on to the idea of terra nullis in the north, which is when you actually do have to admit that there are people there, you also need to um, kind of cast onto those people the need for conversion, right? the kind of bringing into a civilizational project of one sort or another. In this particular case, it's kind of bringing people into um, the Soviet project through conversion to a particular understanding of socialism. Um, and again, this is a way of eliding or erasing or ignoring questions of actual practical sovereignty on the ground by saying that people there really didn't understand ownership didn't have ideas of land, didn't know the correct economic form, and versions of these ideas emerge kind of all over. There's a capitalist variant, there's a socialist variant, but kind of at the core is the idea that if you go to the North and you do find people there, they are a resource to be converted, right? And one of the most striking things about doing research on both the Russian and American sides of the Arctic is that there are these instances where if you swap out Marx for Jesus Christ, you get virtually identical texts and the kind of goals of conversion are are really um, remarkably similar. And some of the Bolsheviks call themselves missionaries. Um, so again, this feels extremely overdetermined. I don't have to do a lot of interpretation um, because the, the kind of actions here are very clear. And I would be curious how far this kind of, um, the, the sort of looking to territories that on the one hand are imagined as critical sort of sources of land, places for states or empires to seize, um, but also as places essentially where you can convert souls, if that's also a dynamic in the South, right? The, the kind of missionarying impulse. I think there's obviously a 19th century version of this when literal missionaries are converting people all over the world, but I think there's also an economic version of this potentially in Lebanon or other places where there's an idea of bringing people into a universalist trajectory of human development that, that has to do with kind of a conversionary narrative. And that is very much what the Bolsheviks are about, right? Lenin going out and hanging with the, with the Chukchi 
uh, indigenous folks in the, the Siberian North is really about kind of making them part of a universal kind of march toward progress. It also means that there's really complicated relationships on the ground because the person who carved this is a master Chukchi carver who sometimes represents Lenin hanging out on a seal poke, but also was producing amazing carvings simultaneously that were kind of fully participant and representing a Chukchi cosmology that had nothing to do with Bolshevism. And so, I mean, one of the other things that's kind of fascinating in these moments of colonial encounter is that they are often very not straightforward in the kind of individual particularities of navigating this. The final image I have, um, this is one of my favorite images. Um, this is an advertisement from 1962 by the Humble um, Gas Company, which is a precursor to ExxonMobil, um, one of our favorites. It's a picture, I think, of the Tuku Glacier outside what is now Juneau, Alaska. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I've actually tried to track down the the particular location. But what's fascinating to me about this image is I think um, it gets to me at this ideal of what I think of as transformation through extraction, which in many ways is this kind of unity of the first two things I was talking about. So you've got your nice Alaska glacier. Notice there are also no human beings in this picture. Never mind that human beings have lived here for a very long time. This is in Tlingit and Haida country. Um, so people have known these glaciers for thousands and thousands of years, have ideas about what glaciers are, who they are in people's communities, all of that nowhere in this picture, right? Just some nice static Alaskan ice. And what this ad is saying is that burning petroleum, which of course requires a great deal of extraction, is so powerful that it can melt um, 7 million tons of glacier in a day, right? This was 1962, and you could say that very proudly, um, and not with the kind of ominous overtones that you would say it in 1920 or 2022. Um, but to me, the, the kind of idea behind this, right, is one where if you are technologically able to extract as many resources as possible, um, what it will do is kind of make climatologically and otherwise these quote unquote empty parts of the world look like everywhere else, right? This is an imagination of climactic transformation as a good thing, um, as something that, that renders a static landscape more dynamic by melting it. Um, and that kind of brings it into that temperate world um, that's being projected up into the North. Um, it's a fantasy of making a sort of universal climate and a universal state of being through fossil fuels. And again, what is not in it, right, is any sense of sovereignty on the ground as people actually have been practicing it for a long time. There's no discussion of indigenous claims in this uh, picture, even though this is 1962. So I think as Jen is gonna talk about, this is actually a moment when Alaskan indigenous claims are a major political issue in the United States. Um, and there's also no acknowledgement that people have known glaciers and known this glacier, um, in very particular and situated ways for a very long time. So to me, this is kind of the ultimate fever dream of sort of 20th century universalism um, that saw making profit from extraction as coterminous with this sort of absolutely desirable form of transformation, which of course reads differently in a 21st century room because um, we see glacial melt generally now as a very bad thing. Um, but I would also say it has long been, there has long been a critique, um, particularly in, in parts of Alaska and Siberia of these kinds of ideas as they're projected north um, that, that predate the sort of climate change. Um, everything is going to melt and be very terrible. Um, so I will end there with just sort of thinking about the ways in which these elisions of sovereignty and knowledge and relationship to land kind of emerge out of the ideological projections. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, first, yeah, thank you, Liz and Alexander, for having me on this panel. Thank you to all the co-panelists. Um, I figured I would use my introductory um, time here to just uh, give a bit of an overview of my project and what I'm sort of bringing to the table on the conversation. 
and then we can sort of open it up and I've, I've been thinking through everything that Bathsheba said and I would very much looking forward to a conversation about that. So um, I am going to draw on, what's that? Yeah, if you go to the first one, it'd be great. Sorry. Yeah, so um, I'm going to draw on my research on Brazilian hydropower dams, which is what I wrote my dissertation about. And I came to the subject uh, interested in what the environmental, social and environmental impacts of low carbon energy look like. We often call low carbon, carbon energy renewable energy these days. And I was interested in, in case studies um, of countries, uh, communities that had, had primarily used, um, gotten a lot of their energy from low carbon sources and what that footprint looked like. And Brazil's a really fascinating case as this uh, diagram shows, I think the, the title got cut off a little bit, but this is Brazil's uh, energy production, excuse me, electricity production from 1920 to 2020. And the, the yellow is hydropower and the blue is thermal or anything else. So for quite a long time, Brazil has gotten upwards of 60%, often 80% of its electricity from hydropower. Uh, it's also had an incredibly, that power is, is quite a lot. It's, Brazil is ranked second in the world behind China in terms of gross output and electricity production. And this is translated into immense carbon savings. So the same amount of electricity produced using coal, natural gas, oil would have produced a lot more uh, carbon emissions that Brazil has sort of spared the Earth's atmosphere. Nevertheless, the dams had uh, enormous social and environmental footprints. And the period I focused in on in my dissertation was about the uh, dictatorship period. Brazil was under a right-wing military dictatorship between the mid-1960s to the mid-1980s. And I focused on that period because it was then that the, the government built sort of its biggest and most iconic dams. These were the dams that sort of uh, cumulatively added more installed capacity to electricity grid than any sort of single period before or since. And they were the ones that produced the biggest reservoirs with the biggest impacts. And so the one of the sort of most uh, sort of alarming impacts was on communities and people that live there. And I have actually a, quite a lot to say about this, like empty empty areas. There's uh, something that I'm, I'm ex excited to talk about. But for this overview, I'll just kind of keep it uh, cursory. And you can go on to the next slide. Um, so indigenous people lived in, in a lot of places uh, where these dams were built. And this is a photo that I, I brought because it's, I mean, it's, it's uh, very horrific and it's also really iconic. So after the dictatorship fell uh, across the country, there were various truth and reconciliation commissions. And this photo was sent uh, to one of those commissions in Paraná in, in Southern Brazil uh, by an anonymous former employee of one of the dam building companies called Itaipu. And the, I didn't make those those marks on there. That's how the photo sort of came across. But they're highlighting uh, various logos for the companies and pointing out fires. But basically, uh, the company first sort of denied that indigenous people even lived there. And then after a lot of pushback, um, they ended up sort of violently displacing them and then flooding their land. And in, in this case and in other cases, too, uh, often these communities went decades without proper compensation. Um, one of the communities, uh, a different community, the Tusha in the Northeast, is still fighting for, for compensation. They were promised land in compensation in the late 80s, and still today they're, they're, they're fighting for it. So this is something ongoing. And in addition to the social impacts, these dams also flooded some I iconic environmental sites. They flooded um, you know, thousands of, of uh, square kilometers of uh, Amazonian rainforest. And so in addition to sort of exploring uh, those impacts itself, I also looked at how that changed over time and how the government responded. And so in Brazil, there was really a big watershed moment after the dictatorship fell in the late 1980s. These dams and their big disasters were, were well publicized uh, during the re redemocratization movement in the late 1980s, and sort of an anti-dam movement formed thereafter. You can go on to the the next photo, um, the last one. Again, it's a little cut off, but basically, a lot of communities in the late 80s, once democracy returned, started fighting uh, against big dams. And in this photo here, this is the Kayapau, actually Belamonchi, which is the dam that was on the uh, opening slide, the, the poster. Um, this was one of the communities most affected there. And there was a big gathering in 1989 called the Altamira Gathering. Uh, and this is a dramatic moment in which one of the leaders of the Kayapo sort of 
threatened the the Electro Norci, which is the company building the dam. One of the technicians there, and it's an, another just really iconic photo in in the history of Brazilian dam building. But it it really shows. Uh, I compared, you know, I brought this as the third image because it just shows the 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 timeline and the change in moment here. And and the post dictatorship period has been um, a story of of sort of gains and losses. So in the Belamonte case. It was originally supposed to be a giant dam with a huge reservoir, and that that never got built. The anti-dam movement was pressured the government to reduce it. It's now a run of the river dam, which means that it doesn't store a giant reservoir that didn't flood any indigenous land. So in some ways, it's that story since the, the dictatorship has been sort of a victory um, on the other for, for indigenous communities and environmentalists. On the other hand, if you talk to many of them, they're still unsatisfied. The dam was still built. It still disrupted fisheries. It still had a huge impact, uh, and it's still something that that is seen in an entire, you know, completely negative light, despite the, the alterations. So that's the kind of that's the situation that that Brazil is in now. It's it's on the one hand, it has an electricity grid that has produced a tremendous amount of low carbon energy, which is sort of laudable in the in the current context of climate change. On the other hand, that that sort of success has come at the expense of uh, a lot of huge social and environmental impacts, particularly among indigenous communities that have been, been the hardest hit. So thanks. Oh, yeah, a... Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you again to Liz and Alex for organizing this session. I'm already hearing tons of really interesting harmonies and parallels with the, the preceding two speakers. So I'm really excited for the rest of it. Um, so what I'd like to do is offer a few thoughts about energy politics and Israeli settler colonialism and how they, as Liz and Alexander lay out in the kind of framing for this conversation, how they help stabilize the global north as a meta geography and vice versa, right? The way that international institutions in particular uh, normalize and naturalize ongoing settler colonial dispossession and erasure in multiple global contexts, which is really central, I think, to the solidity and the solidarity of, of the global north. So I should say at the beginning, as I think has been clear, I'm not a historian of Israel or Palestine, uh, but I am a historian of how these dynamics have played out in the Eastern Mediterranean more broadly. And since the partition of Ottoman Syria at the end of World War I, that whole region has really been one of disputed and shifting borderlands. And one of the regions, one of those disputed borderlands is the one that I look at, which is the Latani River Basin, which is in parts of Lebanon called South Lebanon and the Beka Valley. And this is a region that the Lebanese state has had various degrees or tenuous forms of sovereignty over really throughout the 20th century and from the period of 1982 to 2000 was under Israeli occupation. And I'm trying to think about that occupation in dialogue with the territories that were occupied in 1967, particularly Sinai, the Golan Heights and Gaza. Now, the first half of the book that I'm working on historicizes a particular logic of, histor of colonial extractivism. It is a history of national, international, and popular sovereignty over the Latani River and its development. And I argue that that history reveals how and why natural resource development became um, really central to uh, practices of claiming territorial sovereignty in the 20th century. And that argument that, that you know, that um, um, resource development was so central to sovereignty came about because of a question I had during my archival fieldwork when I became fixated on one of the main discursive strategies that Israel has used to justify its ongoing dispossession of Palestinian lands and resources, which is that those lands and resources are wasted, right? And that the fact that they are wasted means that they are somehow eligible for occupation and that occupation is a practice of resource development that puts them to maximally efficient use. And that interested me because Israeli leaders in the early part of the 20th century used the same argument to try and claim sovereignty over uh, the Latani. So in the 1940s and 1950s, which is the, really the heart of my book, a number of Israeli leaders, Moshe, Moshe uh, Sharet, uh, principal among them, repeatedly made statements to the effect that because Lebanon was letting the Latani River run wasted into the sea, this is this repeated phrase, wasted into the sea, um, that um, uh, the Israeli state had a right and an intent to claim uh, sovereignty over it through diplomacy or force. And many international observers at this time 
thought that that argument was plausible. Um, and Lebanese engineers, who are some of the main characters of my book, were very concerned about defending against these claims. So they too warned that their country was wasting the Latani River. And if they didn't develop it quickly, that Israel might capture the river and that the great powers would not intervene. So um, if you can actually show the first image, and this is actually the only image I'm gonna talk about. The other two, maybe I can talk about later. Um, um, so this image is from the Agricultural Engineers Syndicates magazine. Uh, and the caption for it is the wealth of Lebanon running wasted into the sea. So it's interesting, right? It's a very bucolic image of a natural landscape and then kind of, in, in you know, has this sense of dread or anxiety around, um, around its wastefulness. So then in the 1960s, after Lebanon had begun constructing infrastructure on the Latani and taken on a big World Bank loan, um, you started to see commentators, journalists saying, um, that uh, once Lebanon had started to actually build infrastructure in the in the basin, Israel backed off, right? And my question was, why did that logic make sense to people at the time, right? Why would Latani running wasted on running on its course, excuse me, naturally be considered wasted? Why would that wasted condition somehow be evidence that it was an invitation to occupation? And why would building infrastructure change that? So my argument in answer to that question is about a strategy that I term effective sovereignty. And this was a political and legal doctrine that a state can most securely claim sovereignty over territory and resources by putting them to maximally efficient use. So damming rivers, drilling oil, putting crops to maximally productive use, those kinds of things. And we've probably encountered this strategy in a number of different colonial contexts, right? Um, and we actually have heard about it from Bathsheba already. Um, and what I'm trying to do is uh, historicize its origins as a dis discursive manifestation of a particular moment in capitalist production in which physical, and by that I mean physics, conceptions of mechanical efficiencies that were, that were being used to guide industrial and plantation management uh, were applied as techniques of government in resource extraction and in international law. Now, I'm interested in diverse manifestations of this idea of effective sovereignty, particularly how it's used in Lebanon as a strategy to kind of nationalize this river basin and to claim sovereignty on a, uh, on a kind of domestic basis. And I'm happy to talk more about those. But in the remainder of my time, I'm gonna talk about, um, just quickly sketch the kind of imperial piece of this and how that shaped the history of Latani development in the beginning. And that begins with uh, the Conference of Berlin in 1884, 1885, which set the legal international framework for the scramble for Africa. Now that conference defined the entirety of the interior of Africa as terra nullius, which is a concept we've already heard explored. And that was something that was well-established in there are many legal precedents and essentially said that any unused territory was a effectively up for grabs for any imperial power to claim legitimately. Um, but then what that conference introduced was a new doctrine called effective occupation. And effective occupation was a method to prove territorial claims to terra nullius. And the most effective ways to do that were to build infrastructure on it or to, um, uh, to, to start putting resources to use, start extracting. Then in 1919, Paris Peace Conference, right, which is uh, for the post-war, uh, post-World War I settlements, um, the allied European empires incorporated essentially this principle of effective occupation into uh, the fundamental justification for the League of Nations. Right? League of Nations is the kind of international legal framework um, that emerges out of World War I um, and set the terms for the partition of Ottoman Syria um, and the administration of, of all the territories, including those in Africa, that were occupied by the Allies during the war, uh, according to a racialized um, civilizational hierarchy in which the development, the capacity to develop resources efficiently was a central marker of civilizational status. Now, at Paris, the Latani River was a central object of contention between France and Britain because they were negotiating over the possible borders of a mandate Lebanon state and a mandate Palestine state. And um, the Latani River was right in the middle of those two things, right? So the French had occupied it militarily. They, they controlled it. But the British and the Zionist delegation to the Paris um, uh, uh, conference 
insisted that the Latani should be included within Mandate Palestine. And their argument, they said, was explicitly an economic one. And it hinged on waste, right? It hinged on the idea that the Latani, because it was flowing, wasted into the sea, it was a standing reproach. That was the language they used. And that because the Zionist organization was the uh, community best capable of putting the Latani to maximally efficient use, they had a rightful claim to do so. Now, those arguments did not win out at Paris, um, and the Latani did remain under French control as part of Mandate Lebanon. But the debates around the Latani contributed to establishing the terms for the League of Nations um, and League of Nations rule, which had, as I've said, the self-defined purpose of enabling empires to develop the resources of peoples that the League deemed incapable and wasteful. And what's so significant, I think, in terms of the kind of broader stability of the idea of glo the global north, about the Zionist contribution to establishing that League framework is how contra more recent arguments about um, Israeli exceptionalism, the Zionist organization were expressly committed to participating in the League's framework for licit imperialism and advertising themselves as the, the as ideal agents of that purported purpose of, of putting resources to maximally efficient use. And this was a pivotal moment in establishing the organization's position in the civilizational and economic hierarchy that uh, the League established, which was in turn a critical building block of the international order that would later flourish as the global north. Thank you. Hello, Alakishu, everyone. Thank you for being here. And thanks again, uh, Liz and Alexander. It's really lovely to be here, especially on Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Kickapoo lands. So when I was reading over the sort of prompt for today, uh, many of the sort of animating themes were about uh, infrastructures of extraction. And writing on Alaska and the Arctic, that's actually something I try and bracket um, because of this sort of overdetermined theme, I think, especially about Alaska and the Arctic, that it's really seen as this kind of zone of extraction. So I was trying to think of places that I found to be sort of rich um, moments that maybe I could add a few thoughts in. So I was thinking about the overlaps of Alaska Native politics, resource extraction, and the politics of indigeneity. And it turns out I do have some thoughts. So here we go. Um, infrastructures of, of extraction in Alaska um, are super intrinsic to many of the socialities as they play out across landscapes, across place, and across space. Um, and there's a lot of specificity that I think needs to be attended to when we're thinking about uh, resource extraction in Alaska. And one way that I've thought about that question is through how oil shapes the political social landscapes of Alaska Native politics, particularly through the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, or ANCSA, which happened in 1971. And up until that point, um, in 1971, as Alaska Native folks, we didn't have a set of sort of preceding land claims that we could use to um, sort of make legal juridical claims to our lands. So that's much different than um, how that played out in the contiguous US the sort of lower 48, as we call it in Alaska. And I think that that's not the case of Hawaii and California, sort of notwithstanding to those two locations, but generally across the, the, uh, the US. So this all stems back to Alaska being purchased by the US from Russia in 1867. We're going way back, so buckle up. Um, so the US was starting to imagine itself at this point as an imperial power. And Alaska, many folks say, this is kind of a point of contention, especially among historians, which I am not. Um, but at this moment, sort of Alaska is thought by some to be the sort of first imperial acquisition um, as, a, as, a, as an empire. And when this uh, purchase of Alaska happened, there was no negotiation with Alaska Native polities. So in sort of the kind of lower 48, what had happened before was there were specific tribes made or specific treaties made with specific tribes. So it was sort of piece by piece legislation made sort of across landscapes with folks. That did not happen in Alaska. So what we think about Alaska sort of like on the map now in a modern sense, that was land acquired wholesale. And so 
because of that fact, um, many Alaska Native people say that Alaska is not actually U.S. land, right? It was never ceded. It was never purchased. Alaska Native folks did not ever give up their lands, which is an important point, too, if you think about the true, like, large amount of diversity of Alaska Native peoples in the state. So today, there are 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska, which makes up almost half of five, the 570 federally recognized tribes in the U.S. So there's a lot of us. We have 20 distinct languages um, across a huge landmass. And so for this whole sort of, like, universal space to be acquired in such a way without any sort of tribe by tribe negotiation is actually um, pretty terrifying if you think about it that way. Okay, so going back to this question of infrastructures of extraction and oil, the whole body of ANCSA, which again was this um, act signed in 1971, it took shape the way that it did and it was pushed through very quickly. It uh, settled in two years, which again is very fast if you think about the, the massive landmass of uh, um, Alaska. And this happened, the sense of urgency happened because oil was discovered in Prudhoe Bay in 1968. So this was sort of the backdrop to why these land claims looked the way that they did. Um, so when you think about oil in Alaska, I think there's definitely all the kinds of like obvious things that come to mind, right? How resource extraction impacts climate change, right? These are the sort of buzzwords that we think about. Um, but there are all of these other formative ways that oil shapes Alaska Native history and Alaska Native politics historically. Um, because many Alaska Native peoples and organizations and polities are deeply entangled with resource extraction in Alaska and not just through a labor sense, right? Like I think when we think about, you know, um, oil extraction on the ground, we think about it through labor, but the entanglement with Alaska Native polities is, is sort of more intimate than that. Like this is a familial sense. These are super intimate ways that oil becomes sort of imbricated in the sociality on the ground. So I think, again, the details of those relationships are really important to stay attentive to. Um, in part because of this kind of American settler expectation of uh, what Native people should be doing and how they should be comporting themselves, right? So Native peoples shouldn't be oil rich, right? They should be poor. Um, they should be fulfilling sort of these stereotypes of the ecological Indian, something closer to nature. Um, they, and if they aren't kind of actively mourning or demonstrating against resource extraction, then they aren't proper native subjects, again, through this kind of American settler gaze. So in these formations of these kind of reductive and essentializing stereotypes of native peoples as ecological Indians, there we, they are expected to sort of perform this kind of hyper-spirituality, the sort of pre-industrial past. And the stereotype also, unfortunately, complicates the real, as you know, Bathsheba was pointing to, the very political and legal ongoing relationships to land and space that Native peoples have maintained with their homeland um, for millennia. And this is misinterpreted as the stereotype itself, right? So this particular set of um, enduring relationships gets seen as the stereotype of the ecological Indian. So within this rubric, the strategies that Native peoples have deployed to then support um, tribal members and community members that doesn't align with this particular essentialism, um, then that again is interpreted as a kind of anti-Indigenous behavior. Um, and geographers Andrew Curley and um, Marley Lister have this great chapter on thinking about um, energy and en energy transition on the Navajo Nation. And they say, um, indigenous nations are not only subsistence communities on the front line of environmental change, but they are also communities embedded in minerals and extraction at the front line of energy transition. So I think to overlook that, to overlook that entanglement and that embeddedment is actually to imagine native peoples as anti-modern and anti-economy. Um, and just to be clear, I'm not pro-oil. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I do think that these these relationships should be negotiated and renegotiated over time. Um, and Native peoples have voices and agencies within their governance systems to do so. However, I believe that that negotiation and renegotiation shouldn't be sort of at the behest of this ecological Indian stereotype, right? That Native peoples have um, sovereign government and governance structures to do what they wish and when they wish. And frankly, that's often no business of ours. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, so I, what we'll do now is we'll have a little bit of discussion amongst the panelists, and then I hope you're all brewing many, many great questions uh, there. Um, I think there are a, a bunch of enormously interesting parallels that come out here. Um, the notion, especially of a, a certain set of timeless expectations about landscapes juxtaposed with a universal temporality of development, which in which people are positioned as, you know, anti-modern or somehow backward. Um, the notion as well of terra nullius that we saw uh, on, uh, across several of these themes, and therefore sovereignty is performed through extraction. But interestingly, I think from both uh, Matt and Jen, the notion too of a, a new twist on this of performing virtue through environmental signaling. Um, and I think that this is one of the things we, we are wrestling with is the aspirational quality of, of ex extraction as well as its, uh, its great horrors. And of course, what comes out very clearly from all four of you is the ongoing nature of colonialism as a process rather than that something that that's happened and that we are post. Um, I suppose my my question, um, just to pick up a thread that I saw coming up in a few places, um, sometimes very literally as in for Owen, um, and I think implicitly um, in some of the rest of your work is about the international here and what it's doing as a space. Um, Bathsheba, your work is in this interesting space between two great empires. Matt, you almost have a boomerang effect story of appeals to environmental causes that reach out beyond borders. And um, for Owen, it, in contrast, the international is a space through which the colonial project is really solidified. The League of Nations, for example, then becomes very much an, an arm of the colonial project. I'm sure it's all on our minds that yet another cop is coming up. So how, what do you think about this space of the international? Are there rooms for, is there room for kind of solidarities between these very different contexts, you know, in the form of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indivi Indigenous People, for example, or certain Southern blocs? I spot India, Brazil, uh, China and so on are all standing up against border tariffs on uh, carbon emissions at the moment. So do you see the international as having a sort of hopeful potential here? Or is it a space of, uh, as we've heard in the Israel-Palestine context, of renewed colonial oppression? Please do use the mic or else the, uh, the, the Zoomies can't hear us. Do you want me to start it? I mean, I have plenty to say about this, um, so I, I can start us off and I'll uh, someone just start waving at me if I'm if I'm talking too long. Um, I, the international is just such a, a huge part of of my project and there's there's different ways uh, that I could talk about it. But the one I think to highlight here is just how important international pressure was for the Brazilian military government to sort of make any concessions at all to mitigating the social and environmental impacts of its big dams. So the Brazilian government kind of, they started building, you know, military dictatorship, military dictatorship, excuse me, took over in the mid sixties and they sort of accelerated dam building plans already underway. And by the early 1970s, it sort of ran headlong into the environmental movement that was surging. Uh, it also ran headlong into the liberation theology movement in Latin America, um, which was a, a sort of social justice movement on the left. And both those uh, forces gained a lot of international appeal. And for 
international lending banks like the World Bank, um, they they threatened essentially curtail loans that were that were under uh, undergirding this big power boom, and so very explicitly the military military government sort of pivoted and reoriented in uh, in reaction directly to this international pressure um, to sort of make concessions, and I've I've thought a lot about it, and it's it's interesting because the 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 thread that I find most interesting about the international pressure is is it. You asked about the optimistic, you know, about if, whether I, you know, whether we think it's there's sort of room for optimism or not, and I've I've struggled with that because on the one hand, in the short term, I think it I think it amplified a lot of concerns among um, people that were struggling for social justice on the ground. So that the first photo I had showed about the houses being burned, that group, at least on the Brazilian side of the reservoir, continued to fight for for their land thereafter, and in the mid um, early 90s, they they late 80s and early 90s, they wrote to the World Bank, who actually didn't fund this dam. Um, but they caught them at a moment when they were funding the Brazilian Brazilian power sector sector um, at large, and they were able to sort of get a response. The World Bank sent um, a, a couple specialists there, and they were engaged in it. And the community I mentioned earlier in the Northeast, the same thing. They, there was sort of a, a moment of pressure there where before this loan got, went through, where the Brazilian government actually did sort of uh, make a lot of concessions. The the trouble is where I sort of become more pessimistic is that that international spotlight faded. And in the case of the Tusha, for example, who were displaced by the dam in 1988, I mean, they're, they're st literally still fighting today for their land. I mean, it's been, they call, you know, I've, I've visited there, I've talked to them and they, they call themselves, you know, a generation without land. I mean, they've, there's now a whole generation who's grown up without land. Uh, and so there's so I think the international it, it has its potential uh, and it played a big role. I the timeline though is is tricky um, because it's maintaining, you know, maintaining that pressure uh, long enough to to sort of affect change. So that those are my initial thoughts. I have more to say, but I want to turn it over to other panelists. Sure, this one. Yeah. You have another mic there. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was interesting because I actually don't, I don't think, I, I think when I think about the, about international relationships, it's often coming from a place of frustration that a place like the state of Alaska is not seen as a place where within it, there are international relationships, right? And that, that, that act of sovereign erasure and blowing it up to the global when we mean international feels like the thing that I'm always, you know, trying to trying to sort of wrestle back to a set of contexts on the ground that were international long before the nation state system, essentially. I don't know if nation, I mean, you can debate whether or not nation is the right word up one side and down the other, but I'll just use it for the moment. Um, I think there are some interesting cases that I saw in Russia when it was still possible to travel there where the capacity for indigenous peoples within the Russian Federation who have far fewer recognized sovereign land claims to reach to international bodies was productive. Um, and actually even being able to use the category of indigeneity within Russian space was something that was enabled by an international context. Um, so I think in, in that sense, it, it can be productive. I think it is currently no longer productive within Russia because of the, the fact that, you know, that all of those discussions have been put on on hold um, very aggressively. It's extremely dangerous to even bring them up right now. So, you know, even within that, the international role is so tempered by some of these other geopolitical issues, but. Um, could I actually show one of the slides that I didn't talk about? It's the one that's a chart of um, kilowatt hour consumption, that one. Okay. so. When it comes to the international, I think I, I work mostly on the 1950s and 1960s period of third worldist internationalism, right, in which everybody recognized that the kind of international structures that I was just talking about, League of Nations and so on, were absolutely arrayed against the potential for self-determination. They were, you know, international law was imperial law. It was a means to facilitate imperial extraction. That was very, very clear. And it was a main part of the kind of political project of many, many groups in that time period. So in that sense, international, I think there's plot, lots to learn from. There's many, you know, very, very difficult lessons, I 
thing to learn from the moments, uh, the moment of third worldist internationalism. But at the same time, it was a space of, of profound um, hope and excitement. And then and during that same time, you see the reconstitution, I think, also of the kinds of civilizational hierarchy that you see the League of Nations through the idea of developed, underdeveloped, um, developing countries, which emerges in the 1950s. And one of the ways that I think is interesting that that first gets articulated before you have GDP, right? GDP becomes a more common metric into the 1950s, end of the 1950s, but earlier on, and the World Bank used this as well, um, electricity, kilowatt hour consumption was one of the main metrics used to uh, organize uh, countries. And you can see on here, right, this is Lebanon. And this was very much Lebanese engineers looking at this and saying, oh, we really need to get that number up. We're having a very serious debate about whether Lebanon is a developed or underdeveloped or developing country. Um, and if we think about it as organizing a kind of global north, global south, you know, you can kind of see, right, what's just above the top is Israel and South Africa, right? Both of which their per capita capita um, kilowatt hour consumption is 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 reliant on a particular determination excuse me determination of per capita right who gets to count as a consumer right it's everybody who is not erased by settler colonialism so again I think this is a really important moment to think about in terms of the the emergence of an international financial and development regime that was organized around very similar principles wonderful stuff <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Did you have anything to say? No, Bathsheba covered it. Okay, I just want to add real quickly, I think in the Brazil case that came to mind as y'all were talking that um, the international also I think works best uh, or th that I've seen when it's sort of amplifying and sort of responding to calls from, you know, from the area, right? I think of the Brazilian case, I feel it just and sort of need to say this because in the Amazon rainforest, especially, there's international calls all the time, sort of save the rainforest. It has a global ecological role. And I know people in Brazil, especially, are very wary. It's, there's a long history of, of Brazilians being wary that people are going to sort of come in and uh, sort of find different ways to justification excuses to take over the, the rainforest using these narratives like you guys talked about the waste. You know, it's not in this case, not that it's being wasted, but it's not being managed properly. It's not, you know, this. So I do want to also just add that element in there that I think there's, at least in my mind, there's a difference between sort of uh, people reaching out in an international community responding and versus people sort of, you know, well-intentioned uh, environmentalist or ecologists sort of uh, coming in and, and um, unknowingly sort of replicating imperialist roles or those those sorts of things. So. Wonderful. Well, we are open for questions, but I'm going to have to bounce towards you with a microphone. Um, oh, Ryan is just stating one. Oh, I think you would have to do that. <laughs> Make sure that the mic is working. But um, hi, folks. My name is Ryan Jobson. I'm an assistant professor in the anthropology department here at Chicago. First, I wanted to thank both the organizers and our panelists, brilliant provocations um, that have got me thinking in a number of respects. My own research is based in, in Trinidad on oil and gas development. That seems to be right next to Lebanon on this, on this chart. But my question is actually for all four of you that I think collectively, all of your comments help us reframe certain language that we use to make sense of these distinct geographies that we're trying to put in conversation. So Again, if we were thinking about global south and native north, both are often talked about as spaces of competing sovereignties, right? That there are sort of competing sovereignties between settler colonial actors um, and indigenous nations, between metropolitan governments and sort of aspiring post-colonial elites. And what I find so instructive about what each of you are saying is that it seems that a revision to think about the invention of sovereignty, or particularly the, the way that sovereignty is framed as like a civilizational gift that has to be granted to indigenous nations. I'm thinking of, you know, Bathsheba's image of Lenin sort of offering this civilizational gift as a, as a benevolent force, um, but also something that has to be cultivated through the kind of technocratic ingenuity of post-colonial elites. So the idea is that when they take state power um, after independence, there's the necessity of being able to aspire to sovereignty through very specific logics of heavy industry, of extraction, of vertical uh, bureaucracy, of hierarchical governance, right? Um, that has to be invented. 
um, in part because of this Lockean discourse about waste and about the the inability to properly achieve this this horizon. So I was I would wanted to hear your comments on this notion of the invention of sovereignty, something that has to be conjured, um, and perhaps how the language, for instance, of indigenous sovereignty or autonomy unsettles this, right? Because I think there've been a lot of debates around whether sovereignty is the proper horizon because it seems to be overdetermined by this sort of Eurocentric genealogy of hierarchical governance. But at the same time, I think it also troubles this idea that this has to be invented or brought as a gift, again, by um, Lenin or our friends in the US State Department, either one. So thank you. Hey, okay, great. Um, this is, I mean, that that was excellent. Thank you for all of your thoughts. It was such an incredible question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if we're thinking about global norths and or global south and native norths, I mean, the the sort of specific forms of sovereignty as they emerge in place and the sort of the temporality of those sovereignties are so important to stay attentive to. The questions of um, sovereignty in Alaska are, like, that's not a main analytic that we use as Alaska Native people to, to think about who we are as a peoples because sovereignty is not baked into the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. So and that's exactly gets to your point, like who is giving the sovereignty, who is um, asserting the sovereignty from where and from which parties does it um, emerge? So I think like all of those questions are so important. Um, I think in a, a U.S. context more broadly, you know, we see ICWA being, you know, trying that trying to be overturned in this in the federal government government right now for the, by the Supreme Court. And so like federally given sovereignty is never a guaranteed, right? It's always constantly trying to be undermined and overturned. Um, so yeah, I guess I don't have a very like specific answer to the amazing question, but those are some thoughts. Yeah, I agree. That's this question like haunts my dreams. I'm not even kidding. Um, like, and what to do with the word sovereignty, even because it's not, it's not in play in Alaska in the same place, in the same way that it is in some other contexts. Um, Fascinatingly, I'm taking a training right now that's for uh, people working for the federal and state government in Alaska on the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, and then the, the big act that sort of redistributed the rest of that land that was purchased in 1867. And the first thing they say in this training is, well, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act didn't grant anyone sovereignty because it was there before. And then proceed to actually completely un undo that sense in like every particularity of how this piece of policy carries out. Um, and I think that it's that it, it's the kind of inability for the, um, you know, in this case, U.S. legal structure, British common law as practiced in the United States legal structure to recognize alternative different, you know, genealogies of um, claim to space that do not come with a hierarchy in the same way that do not have aspirations in the same, you know, sense have aspirations, of course, because all societies do, but not necessarily identical. Um, it, that inability to be attentive to particularity feels like exactly the reason that this term is so fraught, um, because it is shoving political structures into a framework that doesn't fit them. And that your two options within that are either to sort of get on the get on the program of becoming sovereign like everybody else and have your hierarchy or to be the ecological Indian, right? And that th those are the vocabularies at hand um, and to, to actually express something else is extremely complicated on the ground. Um, I can just say briefly that um, um, that the main kind of struggle amongst elites in Mandate Lebanon and post-colonial Lebanon, mandate being under French rule, uh, was around the question of national self-determination and uh, sovereignty. So, you know, I'm particularly interested by these state technocrats and private sector technocrats who were very much organized around the project you described, right, of, of, of cultivating national sovereignty through 
industrialization, through resource management, you know, as both a performance of sovereignty as well as of the practical tools that would ensure economic, meaningful economic self-determination in the context of a, of a global cold, cold war and, and capitalism. Um, and then in the Latani River Basin itself, this is a region that never really fully acquiesced to the to Lebanese nationalism or to the Lebanese state. Um, then the movements that emerged there were, you. I mean, you can analytically frame it as being a question of popular sovereignty. Um, they certainly don't use the term indigenous to refer to that that relationship of power or or to themselves. Um, but the, the primary motivating vocabulary that they would use for their political projects was social justice, right? So social justice emerges in, 19, in the 1950s in, in Lebanon and across the Arab world is one of the primary kind of political imaginaries that um, is, is one of the only kind of real vehicles for popular popul uh, politics, including in the Latani Basin. I don't have too much to add on this. Those are all brilliant answers. So I can give you guys to... Hey everyone, thank you for, for your talks. My name is Tomas Amancio. I'm a PhD candidate here, the program of um, Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian Studies. Uh, and my question is about this notion of, of development, right? And, and this idea, I think it has to do with a lot of what all of you have said. Um, but I'm coming from a former president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, who was on campus this week, right? And, and she was... Uh, responsible for the for the finishing the construction of Belo Monte. She was involved in, in the energy department in multiple levels uh, in Brazilian history. And she defended uh, Belo Monte, although she's heavily criticized by a lot of people about that. But her whoops, was a leftist government, very invested in social inclusion and even like social justice maybe, right? And for her as a person who is who has been in the inside and speaks very frankly about this is a lot about the cost, right? And and, and of course we can we can always uh, uh, ask who who pays the cost, right? In the end, but I I I'm thinking about this idea of development, not only which has been heavily criticized, right? But it's one thing to criticize it uh, based on what criteria we use, right? Like the GDP to 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 consider what development is. Uh, and it's another thing to say, oh, development is uh, fueling the, the the production of plastic toys. And of course, we will all be immediately against that. But when we talk about development as access to education, access to water, access to, to basic, uh, you know, like, um, I forgot the sanitation, is that the word you'd be using in English, right? It's a completely different story, right? And she was saying that Brazil never had a, a welfare state, right? Uh, her government and President, President Lula's before her were trying to kind of bring people out of poverty uh, and uh, hunger, right? Uh, and so how do you do that for millions of people in, in a country like Brazil, right? And so uh, I, I don't know, I was just wondering uh, how these different scales, right, uh, can be engaged, you know, in these conversations about, you know, the the costs on the ground, the costs for 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 native populations, which is a very important issue in Brazil, as, as Matthew uh, highlighted. Thank you. I'm happy to start us off since you mentioned Brazil. Um, that was was very well put. Uh, I'm not sure I have sort of an answer to the query on the the dilemmas of of development, but I think you brought up a lot of important issues that I've I've seen come up. And yeah, that's that's certainly been a common theme throughout what I've found in Brazilian history and the history of Brazilian dam building as well. Uh, the idea, I mean, so uh, for those of you not familiar, I, I mentioned earlier the Stockholm Conference in 1972. I mean, the Brazilian delegation famously sort of disrupted the conference because they said, uh, we're actually pro-pollution, essentially. We, we, we like we need to industrialize, we need to provide electricity, basic services, sanitation to people, like environmentalism is essentially a priority of rich nations, right? That's not like, and so in the military government, which was very right wing, their sort of whole idea, which has come under a lot of criticism, uh, was that basically you you sort of increase the, the pie, so to speak, and they even use this phrase, right? You increase the pie and then everyone's sort of share goes up, right? And that that was sort of as far as they went. And then as you mentioned, right, Joma and, and well, Lula first and, and, and Joma, the, the government that came in power afterwards were much more left-leaning and their, their idea was to sort of divide that a little more. And so 
yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of tensions to play. I mean, to add one more element in there too, there's also the, the issue of climate, right? There's not only the balance between the um, sort of providing basic services and, and improving living conditions and, um, and sort of financial social costs, like you talked about indigenous people, but also there's the issue of now carbon, you know, in the last couple of decades um, that has, that has been increasingly on the agenda in the Brazil case. That's why I found it so interesting is because there, there are, that's, you can add that to the balance sheet, you know, in terms of, for example, Bellamonchi or something, right? I mean, it's, Amazon's actually a little different and I, I could say more about that at a different venue, but a lot of dams in the Amazon actually end up producing methane and carbon because of the, the way the, the um, trees decompose under the water. So those are kind of the exception, but, but the, the dams elsewhere in Brazil certainly have that benefit. So uh, I don't know if there was an answer to your question in there. All that's to say is that I think you're, I, I like the way you're thinking and I, it definitely dovetails with a lot of things I've been thinking about. So if there's anything I can be more precise that I sort of glossed over, just ask me again and I'll, I'll yeah, happy to say more. Um, I can go next. Um, I think that you're, I, I, I really like um, the question and it, it speaks to something that I try to do throughout my work, which is to disaggregate um, concepts of development. So development's a term that gets used in a lot of different contexts uh, to mean a lot of different things. Um, and, you know, I'm very interested in various strategies and methods and conceptualizations of development that are emerging in the Latani River Basin in particular as this really generative space. And, and I think you see that in a number of places that are the kind of resource landscapes where people have, you know, a particular way of negotiating, you know, private enterprise, negotiating the state that emerge around, and they might use the term development, or they might use other ones, but they're all kind of involved in the same idea around it. I think, you know, not to be prescriptive, but I think that what's, um, what but, you know, the, the the big issue that that was oriented around many of the forms of international development of the 1950s and 1960s is that it was brutally anti-democratic, right? And democratic control of resources or democratic and decision making around um, around the transformations of landscapes is, is I think, um, one of the lessons that emerges out of those decades. Yeah, we have a question from Zoom. Um, this is, I think, directed at Bhat Chipa, but I think um, also has resonances for Brazil. Uh, so Arthur Lopez asks, um, when you were talking about your third picture, you mentioned the fantasy of making a universal climate, a conversion of the north into a temperate land that could be productive like its southern counterparts. Um, this has happened successfully in some places in the global south. For example, in Brazil, the vast Gerardo, um, in the center of the country, where the soil was originally acidic, has um, been environmentally re-engineered to become a major soy growing region. Do you see cognate processes happening in the no native knots that you study? There's definitely a lot of talk about it. Um, there are these, to me, rather kind of horrifying balance sheets that come out periodically about who's going to be the winner during climate change, right? And it's often Canada and Russia are held up because they have large quantities of Northern territory. And the idea is, well, it'll just get warmer. The, the kind of agrarian zone will move South. It's sort of a, a literal projection of this. Um, and Canada is actually baking these ideas into their um, their sort of long-term economic projections, right? It's they've, they've taken it very seriously. And I don't think it's disconnected from their ongoing tar sands sort of interests, right, is that they do see themselves, they have a lot of water, they're going to have more farmland, they've got a lot of petrol products. And it's, again, I don't really have to do much interpretation here. It's actually just in the, the kind of ways that the Canadian state is thinking right now, under a quite liberal government. Um, and I, you know, I think that, so there's that level of conversation. And then there's a the level of people being like, it turns out I can now grow potatoes successfully in the place where I live. Um, <laughs> which are, I think, actually quite different conversations um, because one of those is an adaptation to a thing that is happening um, and the other is a, a kind of direct desire to kind of continue that um, sort of universalist strain into the future. Hello, oh, um, for Professor Smith, I really appreciated the description of 
production of Alaska as a spatial and imperial construction across like borders and oil extraction, racialized batteries. And now I think ideas of conservation also seem to be very prevalent in Native North discourse. And I'm wondering what the relationship between contemporary environmental conservation in Alaska and geogra geographies of oil extraction and settler colonialism as co-constitutive ent entities. I wonder what that relationship broadly is and how and whether you would agree or disagree or what you thought of like an understanding of conservation efforts as a practice of colonialism and ongoing oil extraction. An easy one. Um, that's a really good question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I think again, like Alaska is such a huge state um, and it, it is such a, diverse land mass that has so many different climates across it that um, I think that that question, I would maybe be a little bit better able to answer it if I knew of like the specifics of like what that conservation, you know, action was in what locale, in what community, um, what were the other forms of development that were happening or not happening alongside of it? Um, because I don't, I don't think there's a necessarily like universal, like right or wrong sort of form of conservation. Um, but certainly there is a tendency in Alaska for conservation forms to happen without the input of Native peoples. Um, so that can always be sort of across the board remedied, certainly. Um, yeah, but that's such a good question. I mean, that in itself is like dissertation project. I hope that you write about that. Like email me, please. Um, thank you. Thanks for that question. Bathsheba, do you want to comment? No, I just for you, but it's, it's really nice. Yeah. She agrees with me. Um, I have a question to whoever of you who wants to respond. Um, how do you grapple in your work and conceptually speaking, but also empirically, how often do you find this phenomena of what's been called the, uh, the extractivism of the poor, right? The idea that... Uh, um, well, many people do buy into development projects promises at, at some point, and then later they might turn against it or something, but that at different points of these projects, there is some kind of uh, um, legitimacy among the people. It's not necessarily the most directly uh, uh, affected by them, but certainly people in the region, etc. I think some of that is covered by the concept that you brought up of the, uh, the, the ecological Indian, I believe. That's like the other side, but yeah. Speaking in general, how do you deal with that? So can you clarify just a little bit? So um, how do, to dealing with the like, the I mean, Indian component of it, is that? I, I, I don't mean in specifically indigenous communities. Okay. I mean, any kind of community uh, that would be you know, from a normative point of view, thought to be on the losing side of any uh, intervention on the landscape. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, overall, that's the point. Okay, yeah. If anyone has immediate thoughts, I mean, I have something to say, but I think I want to mull over it a little bit. So does anyone, anyone have anything on hand? Um, I guess some things that come to me um, immediately are that like, so the, this like five minute, you know, notes that I gave are certainly not like, not every single Alaska Native person or like Alaska Native polity is entangled with um, resource extraction. And so the way that INCSA is actually set up, it does create sort of, it's a classist system as well. So within Alaska Native populations, classes are then produced and reproduced based on who has access to what kinds of resources across the region. And so within that, there are, you know, groups of of folks that do sort of, I think, feel what you're talking about in terms of the extractivism of the poor, certainly. Like it's not a question of like across the board, every single native person benefits equally from resource extraction and oil development in the state. Um, so again, I just feel like maybe I'm a broken record, but of like staying attentive to all of those like really, you know, like important complexities that you're bringing up. 
<laughs> I I also think, and this this is maybe just another way of saying be attentive to the particularities, but not assume a particular outlook from any given person just because of where they happen to live or other kinds of identity factors, right? And secondly, don't expect everyone to be consistent. I think often we go looking being like, you are a, this kind of person and therefore your relationship with that must always at all times be pro-extractivism or anti-extractivism. And, you know, having, I'm, you know, we've all met individual human beings, right? We know that we're just these giant bundles of contradictions and, and are actually quite capable of carrying on long complex lives with those contradictions at play. And I think to me as a historian, the interesting things is seeing when it is that those contradictions actually harden into identities that become kind of politically forceful, right? Where you you have to start picking particular sides. But I, I think you can even look at something like farming communities in the Midwest, where on the one hand, basically everybody I know, I come from a farming community in Iowa, everyone is unbelievably critical of the way that sort of large scale mass farming has transformed their jobs. They don't like them. They find them tedious and, you know, there's lots of romanticism, but there's also like a kind of sophisticated critique of capitalist production happening simultaneously. And on the other hand, we'll fight for every possible subsidy out of the farm bill simultaneously to make sure that that regime stays in place. And those, those two things are like totally operative 100% of the time together. And so I think, you know, give, giving people the grace to to be as complex as we are is important. I think that's a very nice note on which to end, actually, because we're out of time. Thank you so much, Jen, Matt, Bathsheba, and Owen. That's been fantastic. Please join me in giving them a round of applause.